right, I think we can go ahead and uh, and get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Katie and, and Sansom team, thank you so much for having us this afternoon. Uh, we're really thrilled to work with the incredible Sansom Diabetes Research Institute to help sponsor this webinar featuring some incredible experts in the field of mental health and diabetes, as well as a very unique patient and caregiver perspective. Um, we'll just briefly touch on the logistics and kind of housekeeping right now before we get started. Uh, we hope to save some time at the end of the webinar for any Q&A, um, so please feel free to use the Zoom chat feature to pose any questions for the panelists um, throughout the course of the webinar. And before we get started, I must also mention um, from an insight perspective that the opinions and statements expressed throughout this webinar are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the opinions or position of INSLED. So um, with all that legal jargon out of the way, let's go ahead and, and get started. Um, my name is Leslie Barrett, and I'm really pleased to serve as the moderator for this event. I'm a senior manager in medical affairs at INSLED Corporation. We are the makers of the Omnipod system. And uh, my background is as a registered dietitian and certified diabetes care and education specialist. Um, I've been working at INSLET for 10 years now, but I'm really honored to have spent my whole career in diabetes care as a, as a CDE. Um, it's my privilege to introduce our panelists. We have Ms. Kara Hornbuckle, Dr. Michael Harris, and Dr. Corey Hood. Um, Kara and Dr. Harris and Dr. Hood, I'm hoping you can just briefly introduce yourselves and tell the audience a little bit about your background personally and professionally. Um, Kara, we'll start with you. Sure, that sounds great. It's so nice to be here today. As was mentioned, my name is Carol Hornbuckle, and I am with Sansom Diabetes Research Institute in Santa Barbara, and I serve as the organization's director of development. And I've lived with type 1 diabetes for over 35 years. My son, Lucas, who is 13, was diagnosed at the age of two. And about two years ago, my daughter, who was seven at the time, was also diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Uh, she's now nine, and both Lucas and I were able to participate in the clinical research trials for the Omnipod 5 system, and a month after my daughter was diagnosed with type 1, we were also able to place her on the OP5 system as well. You bring some incredible perspective. Um, Dr. Harris, I'm wondering if you can provide the audience with a brief intro, please. Sure. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Michael Harris. I'm a pediatric psychologist by training with expertise in type 1 diabetes, um, I don't have type 1, but I've uh, worked with thousands of young people with type 1. I'm particularly interested in working with teenagers with type 1 diabetes and their families. And I've been involved in a variety of both uh, clinical uh, efforts as well as research efforts around how families uh, coalesce around type 1 diabetes and helping uh, young people to be successful and live their lives while also managing diabetes. Thank you. Dr. Hunt? Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Corey Hood. I'm a psychologist and a professor. I work at uh, Stanford University. And um, in addition to doing this work uh, professionally, I have type 1 diabetes myself and uh, I've been taking care of it for a little over 23 years. Um, and really, the you know, the um, similar to Dr. Harris, a, a lot of the work is focused on the um, kind of quality of life and things outside of the health side of type 1 diabetes and trying to help uh, people manage. Uh, we have a particular interest in, in diabetes devices and systems and um, have um, had the experience of um, being part of the clinical trials, um, both for automated systems, um, both as a participant um, and then also as an investigator. And so I'm excited to be here and look forward to the discussion. And Dr. Hood, you also are the founder of Diabetes Wise, right? Which is a, a platform to help people living with diabetes navigate through um, the introduction of different diabetes tech options that might suit them. Yeah, absolutely. And um, thanks for mentioning that. And um, so we, there's a website called diabeteswise.org, which is not for profit. It's funded through some grants from the Helmsley Charitable Trust. And um, what we do on there is try and make it as easy as possible to understand what's available to, to kids, families, adults, um, when they um, need to take care of uh, type 1 diabetes. And so it's a, hopefully a, a, a good resource for people with diabetes and their families. 
Wonderful. Thanks for sharing. Dr. Harris, I love that your passion is for teenagers with type 1 diabetes because that's such a difficult time in everyone's life. But then to add type 1 diabetes on top of that um, can be really challenging. So it takes a really unique um, perspective to, to have such a passion for that. And we we really applaud you for that. Um, the just focus one, one disclaimer about that. So yeah. I, do, I do have a teenager at home and she would say that I don't know anything about teenagers. So <laughs> Just, um, just want to lay that out there because, you know, I'm like every other dad. I, I don't know what I'm doing when it comes to managing my daughter. We want to make sure it's a fair and balanced uh, webinar yes. this evening. So thank you for adding that. Um, so recently we partnered with Sansom to do another, um, another webinar a few months ago. And the focus of that one was on diabetes management techniques throughout various life scenarios and, and um, conditions, steroids, things of that sort, exercise, and um, Omnipod 5, which, you know, very often those are the topics when we think of automated insulin delivery and what impacts patients. But um, type 1 diabetes is really unique in that it impacts the entire family unit in so many ways just beyond glycemia and A1C and time and range and all of that. Um, I think we could all agree it's a very demanding disease state. So we really wanted to focus the objective of today's webinar on quality of life, particularly related to diabetes technology and automated insulin delivery and these outcomes beyond glycemia. Um, this is a topic I'm really thrilled to discuss and I think it warrants particular attention and focus in the diabetes space. Um, so Kara, I'm, I'm gonna kick it off with you and I'm sure you can attest to this, but type one diabetes is really mentally straining and intimidating for everyone involved in the care process of the disease state. And you have a very unique scenario, both as a person living with type one diabetes, as well as a caregiver um, for your son and daughter. So does type one diabetes ever become less intimidating when dealing with a new diagnosis within the family? You know, was it easier the second time around or is it just as hard, you know, when your daughter was diagnosed as your son? Sure. You know, that's a that's a really good question. And a couple of weeks ago, I was actually at a lecture and I was hearing somebody talk um, who said something and it wasn't related to diabetes. But as I was reflecting, it really resonated a lot um, with with diabetes and a diagnosis of type one diabetes is a lot like a marathon. You have to train for it. You have to prepare for it. And over time, you improve and you start getting into this, you know, to this groove and you're starting to learn a lot about your body. The difference is when you're training for a marathon, that's something that you're planned, that you're planning, and that's something that you signed up for. But a diagnosis of type 1 diabetes is something that is so unexpected. And there's this shock, um, there's this grieving period that is, you know, very hard for families or people who are diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. So what I would say is that in my experience um, with having both children with type 1 diabetes, that it is, you know, it is so hard, that initial diagnosis and um, there's this period of time where it's, it's just a very dark period of time. But all of a sudden after, you know, this, this period of time is different for everyone, but there becomes a time where all of a sudden you're like, you know what, I've got this. I think I have the tools. I know what I'm doing. Things might change, but there's this sense of, of comfort and confidence in living with the disease. And so that is different for everyone, but in, in our perspective, that's, um, that's how it's happened and shaped out for our family. I love that analogy of the marathon training. And I think, you know, what what your story tells me is that with with knowledge comes power. And um, and I, I think that can be really empowering. You start to become more confident in the disease state and and um and that helps probably with the training of the marathon, so to speak. Um, you know, I was recently listening to a, a podcast that Inslet hosts called Beyond the Bolus, and we had a diabetes behavioral psychologist, Dr. Polanski, um, and he said that he starts a clinic visit with a patient by saying, can you tell me what's living with diabetes like for you? And it really struck me when I was listening to this podcast because so often a diabetes clinic visit is focused on A1C or time and range, or how are we going to adjust your insulin settings? So Dr. Hood and Dr. Harris, how do you approach this conversation when you see your patients? Because I thought right away that that type of question is probably just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to getting into a visit with a patient and probably uncovers so much. Um, so what struck me as so astounding probably doesn't strike you quite as astoundingly, but 
um, just wondering how, how you start that conversation to uncover, um, uncover the rest of the iceberg, so to speak. Yeah, um, I'll start and then um, Michael will jump in. But I think that the um, it's it's a it's a really good question, and I think that many times families, when they're asked that question, aren't exactly sure how to respond because usually they're not asked it. So yeah. you know, I think that um, so I I think that sometimes they have to sit and think a little bit about what it's like because sometimes it feels like chaos. Sometimes it feels like being busy all the time. Um, constantly looking at, at, you know, what needs to happen, worries about, you know, potentially being low. There's a lot that a person can feel. And so I think that sometimes when they're asked to describe what it's like living with diabetes, they, they're not always sure where to start. And so sometimes we, I think that I, you know, I try and, you know, sometimes narrow it down a little bit for them, you know, tell me a little bit about what it's like daily for you. Tell me a little bit about, you know, what you think about at night, you know, before you're going to bed. And if you're a caregiver, are you worrying about your child going low and for yourself? And so, you know, I think that this is really, like you said, Leslie, like opening, um, it's a, a bit of the tip of the iceberg, but I think then we follow it up often with some very specific questions about, you know, different situations. Um, Dr. Harris, any anything else? Yeah. So um, knowing that at least from my perspective, coming to clinic is is pretty much punishing. Um, you know, you're you never. Uh, it's not really a, a an opportunity to call out successes and wins. It's mostly to identify problems and then see how that can change. So my tact is a little bit different um, than Bill's. Um, the first thing I do is I thank people for being there and, and I acknowledge that that is a, a huge accomplishment in the grind of diabetes just to be, get to clinic um, because it is punishing. And then the second thing I typically do is lead with, tell me what's working for you um, because I want their experience to be in clinic as an opportunity for me to, to uh, acknowledge what is working and call out those wins because I know when they leave my office, and they go back into the world, they're going to be immersed in, in, you know, all the challenges, all the difficulties, all the losses, frankly, in managing diabetes. Um, it really gives them a chance to reflect on um, the incredible thing they are doing. I'm, I'm just amazed that people do this. As long as I've been involved in this, you know, I, I think, well, could I do this if I was diagnosed with, with diabetes? And I just I don't know if I could, I guess I would have to, but I am just amazed at what people do um, to live their lives and and also manage their diabetes simultaneously. And so I, I feel like my role is to, to highlight that success. Uh, and then, you know, obviously, you know, opportunities to see if there's anything I can help with in terms of improving quality of life while also successfully managing diabetes. I love that you take time to celebrate the successes because um, that can make such a meaningful difference in how that how that dynamic plays out during that clinic visit too. Um, so Kara, I'm really curious from a, a patient and caregiver standpoint, how do you incorporate these types of discussions within your family unit, you know, at the at the dinner table with your kids? And do you have any advice for attendees who may be caregivers listening in tonight on how families can foster these types of discussions at home as well? Sure. Yeah, that's a great question. And this is really to piggyback on what um, Dr. Harris was just men mentioning. Um, with our kids, there are, you know, there's a lot of hard things that come up with living with type 1 diabetes. But as a family, it's really important to us to acknowledge that th the successes as well, because there are a lot of successes related to living with type 1 diabetes. Uh, however, that's not to say that when our kids are having a hard time, um, or even if I'm having a hard time with something related to type 1 diabetes, maybe their um, insertion site hurt, or maybe they have to wait a bit to have a meal because their blood sugar is running a little bit high. I think for me, it's really important to acknowledge those feelings. But at the flip side, I don't like to dwell on it. I don't like to just go on and on and on about it. I like to say, you know what, I hear you. I understand and get through that moment. And then later when they might be, have their spirits might be better and they might be in a better framework to talk about it, to spend that time um, talking through whatever issue there, there might be. Um, you know, the kid, our kids take on so many things living with type one diabetes more than what most of their kids do. Um, and so I like to, you know, I like to really honor that. 
And, you know, to see my kids that they're reading a nutrition label, or they can think about how various foods might impact their blood glucose levels, or they're thinking, you know what, I just have a lot of active insulin on, on my, on board. So maybe I should wait a little bit to like jump on the trampoline. Um, it is so heartwarming as their mom to see them thinking through those things. And so it's important to me, if I could say to any of the parents out there is just to continue to acknowledge all of the incredible work that, you know, your children are, are doing living with diabetes, because oftentimes as the parent, we're saying in the background, like turn your, your, your beep is going off or your alert is going off, or did you dose for dinner or what did you have for a snack? And so I think it's, we can get caught up in that, but I think it's also just so important to acknowledge all the wonderful things that our children are doing living with um, this disease. It's a great response. And what I'm hearing so far throughout this, you know, just short 15 sure. minutes to celebrate the wins. And um, it's really important to look at the successes and acknowledge that and just recognize what it takes to and that we're all human. Um, you know, I, I think probably as a caregiver, you so often focus on glucose values and what did you dose? How many carbs do you count for that? But there's probably this really delicate balance of making sure that not all discussions with your kids are focused on type one diabetes and glucose values and insulin dosing. And that way your kids know that they're more than just their diabetes um, or that you're not policing every, every glucose value or every carb gram that they're entering in. Um, and sometimes that can be the source of diabetes burden in, up, in and of itself because life has other stressors too. So um, what kind of dynamic has diabetes technology played on that? Has you, have you seen a reduction in burden because now you can see CGM values or um, how, how do you feel that diabetes technology has changed that dynamic for you as a caregiver? That's a really great question. And as we were talking, um, the first thing that came to mind is uh, yesterday morning when I was getting ready or my husband and I were getting ready, he says to me, did you hear Lucas last night? I mean, I could hear like he was eating like these, this, all this candy on all these wrappers and it was leftover um, Halloween candy. And um, I looked at his control and I could see that he had dosed for 50 carbs at like 930 at night. And, um, you know, the system carried him out and he was doing great overnight and everything ended really well. But I just looked at my husband. I said, you know what? He's 13. This is what 13 year olds do. Um, so not to dwell on it, but it, it was kind of funny. Uh, technology has absolutely revolutionized, revolutionized the way that our family has lived with type one diabetes. When Lucas was diagnosed with type one diabetes, when he was two, continuous glucose monitors were not really accurate. And a few months after his diagnosis, um, we were able to place him on an insulin pump. And this, this really changed everything being so little and not knowing if he was going to be able to complete an, uh, a whole meal, we would dose him for a little bit before, during, and after. And so having that pump therapy was just so critical in his diagnosis. Um, then shortly later, he was able to get on a continuous glucose monitor, which meant that we were able to provide like these excellent alerts when something serious was going to go happen with his uh, diagnosis. Um, what is really unique is that, you know, we had to wait over this like period of time to get Lucas on a closed loop system. But uh, I mean, many years after his diagnosis. However, when Cameron, our daughter was diagnosed with type one, it was one month after her diagnosis where we were able to put um, the Omnipod 5 system on her. And even the night we realized that she had developed type one diabetes because of all the supplies we have in our house, we placed a Dexcom on her, um, which really, the, the difference between Lucas's diagnosis and Cameron's diagnosis is completely different. We just were so much better equipped because of all the amazing advances that have really taken place over the years. Dr. Harris or Dr. Hood, do you have anything to add on that from a, um, a clinician perspective on what you've seen real life in clinic? And do you think your patients would echo Kara's sentiments on how diabetes technology um, has impacted that dynamic for them? Uh, well, uh, Dr. Hood's really the expert on this, but I, I, uh, Kara said something that really just I love to hear, and I wish more people would say that more parents actually that would say is she said that's what 13 year olds do. And I think sometimes we as parents forget when our children have um, a health challenge that somehow developmentally they're going to move through development and into adulthood and make adult type decisions as opposed to 
this is what a normal, healthy 13-year-old would do or 10-year-old or 9-year-old or 15-year-old. And I, I think that's a piece that I really struggle with when working with families is helping them to impress upon that nothing magical happens when you're diagnosed with diabetes that changes your developmental trajectory, which is good, but it's also bad. It's good because you're going to move on the developmental trajectory as expected. It's bad because you're going to be doing things that normal kids do that potentially get in the way of successful diabetes management. So um, anyway, I'd, I'd love that you you recognize that and called that out. That's impressive. And aren't we all sneaking some Halloween candy right now? <laughs> you bet. Yeah. We ha yeah, we have a lot stored away at our house that, to make it through the, you know, the cold months out here in California. So, no, but, um, <laughs> no, but, I, and I, similarly, I, you know, as I was listening to Kara, I, I was just thinking, like, I, I mean, I could listen to you and your experiences and, um, you know, all this whole hour. And so I think that it a couple of the other things that I really like that, that relate to this technology question that you, you mentioned, Leslie, I think are, um, you know, uh, technology doesn't change that we still should focus on the process of taking care of diabetes versus the outcomes. And I know that every time we all go to clinic and, and I've been guilty of this as a provider as well, but, you know, there's such a focus on, you know, what's your A1C? how much time and range you have, you know, how have you been doing with other parts of your health? And, and really it's, you know, the, how people get there is by focusing on those small parts. And, you know, Carrie, you mentioned, you know, recognizing when there's a nutrition label that's read or that there's a connection made between something that they did, you know, a kid did, and this goes for adults as well, you know, thinking about when you find those connections and, and really kind of recognizing and praising those and, and I, I think that what happens with technology is that sometimes there's we we, we maybe skip that connection. Um, but one of the things that I do a lot of times in working with anybody who's using technology, you know, it goes back to one of the things Michael was saying too, is to you know really you know recognize that it takes work to wear these things, and it takes work to think about them. It takes work to process the information that comes in, and so the i think that there is it's consistent that there can be a lot of benefit to cgms and insulin delivery and the omnipod 5 has great data on both the glycemic and the you know the psychosocial side um and but at the same you know at the same time people still have to work at it and so they deserve to be you know acknowledged and recognized for that and so i think that um, that's uh, so, so I think one of the things that's maybe changed a little bit, there's been a lot of benefit, but sometimes I think the whole community feels like it's a little bit easier and maybe there's a little less burden associated with some parts of it, but it's still a lot of work to take care of it. And so I think just continuing to recognize that people are still putting in a lot of effort. And then the only other thing I would say, um, is that, you know, trying to, to improve access to this because you know i think that whenever we we know that these things work and they really should be push you know we should be pushing them to be standard of care and and really be accessible to everybody at the, that wants them and so even you know there are people that aren't going to want them but most people um would would take them and use them and use them well yeah, I think, you know, one thing we saw early on with Omnipod 5 is some people just have a, a challenging time relinquishing control of type 1 diabetes to a device. And I'm sure that's not unique to Omnipod 5, but can be applicable to all AID systems. And you go from such tight management on your own, just entirely independently to now trusting in a device and a system that is doing a lot of that for you. And that can be um, probably pretty challenging too, to kind of transition to that as well. Um, Kara, did you did you experience that at all yourself or um or perhaps Lucas? Yeah, yeah, um definitely. I mean it's you know when you're switching to anything new um with diabetes, there is some sort of learning curve period. And there's this this opportunity where you know you're trying to figure it out and figure out all the tweaks. 
um, that you're trying to just get it right so that it works okay for your body, or maybe it doesn't work that well um, for your body. But you know, what I always think is it's, and what I will say to people is when they're thinking about changing therapies, you can change something and you can do it for a period of time. You don't have to do it forever, but just try it and see if this might be something that works well for you. You don't have to commit to it for your life. This is, you know, just to see if it might improve. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, Dr. Hood, you've been really involved in diabetes quality of life research, and there may be attendees on this call right now who hear different terms that, that we're speaking or um, hear about diabetes distress and think to themselves like, gosh, this kind of, kind of sounds familiar, or I've been experiencing this burden. Um, and I'm wondering if you or, or Dr. Harris can um, perhaps define what does it mean to have diabetes distress or feel like you're experiencing diabetes distress? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And I think that um, certainly in kind of the healthcare space, we often make things a, a little bit more complicated than they need to be. Um, and so I talk to people about um, diabetes and I often just say, you know, it's just the uncomfortable emotions that come along with having diabetes and everybody's going to have it at some point they're not always going to be there but really it's it's those kind of uncomfortable feelings that come along with with the daily management of it and so and then then I kind of broaden it a little bit to think about you know it can be stress it can be things that feel like people talk about with depression it can be where you're um, frustrated or you're angry or you're a little bit less motivated. Um, all of, and all of those things can be part of how we think about diabetes distress. And so, um, but it's really a, you know, I, I also think about each individual person with diabetes or their caregivers as really being the expert of their own experience with it. And so some, I think that's why it's so important for us to ask these questions of them and how they're feeling and what are the things that they're experiencing. Um, and because we usually do have some good strategies to help them whenever they're feeling stressed or distressed or anxious about potentially having a low blood sugar and things like that. Wonderful. Um, Can I add something to that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so um, what I really love about the concept of diabetes distress is as a psychologist, I don't know how many people know this, but we rarely use context to determine whether somebody is struggling with an issue. So it's a series of symptoms and then there's an impairment. So if you have depression, it's you have a certain number of symptoms, certain type of symptoms, and then it impairs some area of your functioning. That's how we diagnose it. So context is nothing, which blows me away that we can look at somebody who is managing this incredible, um, incredibly challenging condition like type one diabetes and not consider that in somebody's emotional experience. So what I also love about uh, the area of diabetes distress is that number one, it's not based on psychopathology, it's based on an expected worry that would come with meeting the challenge of managing diabetes. So we're not surprised by the fact that people struggle with this, it's expected. Um, the second thing is back to what Corey was saying is that if you take that that perspective of diabetes distress, it's really based in stress and coping literature. It's not based in the psychopathology literature. The psychopathology literature would say you need psychotherapy. Well, I can count on my hand the number of kids that I've worked with that need psychotherapy. You know, they they live with this condition. It's challenging, and so they need help with coping with the stressors of living with diabetes. And those are, it doesn't mean you don't do anything about it. It just means it's a different intervention that has, can have a profound effect on their overall coping um, with this condition. So um, it's actually a really important concept that was brought forth by some of our colleague, Corey and my colleagues. But um, I, I don't know that universally healthcare providers really have a good handle on this as much as they should. Because I still get referrals for young people who are struggling to manage their diabetes, and I'll see in the chart that they they think they have depression, they have anxiety, or something like that. Uh, and then when I meet them, I realize they are just dealing with the ups and downs of this really hard to manage condition. You know, there's there's um, 
so few experts like you that people living with diabetes would have access to. And I'm wondering if Dr. Harris, for attendees listening um, this evening to this topic right now, who may not know how to approach their healthcare provider, who don't have access perhaps to a behavioral psychologist like yourself, how can they approach their healthcare provider or their clinician about diabetes distress and the burden that they're experiencing related to diabetes management? Do you have any advice for them in that scenario? So the American Diabetes Association has put out a directory of behavioral health and mental health providers who've been trained in a variety of um, aspects of managing diabetes. And so that would be a first step to see if there is anybody within their area that they could potentially reach out that has this background in diabetes and diabetes distress, among many other aspects of, of diabetes. The, the second place I would go, you know, it's back to stress and coping. And um, what I have found is the, the diabetes community, the, the type one community, especially in social media, is an incredible community and offers incredible support, ideas, um, strategies for coping. And I think people can benefit just as much from reaching out to somebody else. You know, social support is the most robust psychological factor in our health. It predicts morbidity and mortality stronger than any other psychosocial factor. And so if, if you're struggling with managing diabetes in terms of diabetes distress, the best thing you can do is connect with other people. Like you don't need a psychologist for that. Connect with other people, be in the presence of others. You don't have to be talking about your diabetes. You don't have to be sharing you know, your worries, just be connected socially we know is a buffer from the stressors of life. It's really quite, you know, it, it sounds simple, but most of us do just the opposite. We isolate ourselves when we're struggling and then limit our ability to, um, to cope effectively. Thank you, Dr. Harris. I think that's, that's incredible wisdom. Um, I wanted to approach the topic of resilience and more specifically diabetes resilience and Studies in people with diabetes have shown that high levels of resilience may lead to improved glycemic outcomes and improvements in quality of life. Um, can, you, can you define diabetes resilience for the attendees listening tonight? Um, Dr. Hood, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Well, um, no, it's a, good, it's a good question and it's a good topic. I mean, it's um, it, sometimes I think about it in a little bit of a, I don't know, ironic way i guess that like if you have diabetes and you're still alive you're resilient like you're you're doing something you're engaging and taking care of it um even if it's not to the level that you want or other people want so there's a certain amount of just doing kind of the day like managing the daily grind and doing the things that you need to do that makes you a resilient person and then I think that go, what goes beyond that is and what really it maybe is at the core of this idea of resilience is finding a way to um, to grow or to expand or to challenge yourself based on your experience with diabetes and so we think about you know resilience whether you know it can be across a lot of different issues but specific to diabetes it's how you take what you what you have or what you've been given with type one diabetes and do something with it and do something positive with it. And it can be, you know, finding a way, like we just heard about, you know, connecting with other people. Maybe that's some way that you're you provide some service or an advocacy for, for others. Um, it can be that you've engaged, you know, you've decided to um, really push yourself in some kind of physical activity way or to do something that, you know, is challenging to you. But resilience is really in the face of some type of adversity, like type 1 diabetes, um, finding a way to get through it and to feel like you're, you know, you're, you're achieving. You don't even have to be thriving. You just have to be, you know, achieving and kind of accomplishing those kind of daily things. Would it be fair to say that diabetes resilience helps you to become more resilient in um, other areas of life as well? And Kara, is this something that you could you could identify with? Oh, absolutely. I think having lived with uh, type 1 diabetes for as long as I have uh, has absolutely helped me 
in so many places throughout my life, throughout my career to just be resilient. Um, you know, and also with just with my children, I, I think about them and how this diagnosis has helped them so much to be really independent. My son learned really early on that, you know, if he wanted to, to do things on his own without mom or dad around or a caregiver around who fully understood type one, that he was going to have to really be able to take charge and control um, of his diabetes. And that was really important to him. And so we helped him with that and we helped to put him in opportunities so that he gradually became independent. And it was, it was not only wonderful for him, but it was really wonderful for my husband and I to be able to, you know, not have to hover and feel like we had to be around so much. I mean, I remember when he was really little, bringing my laptop and my lawn chair to baseball practices and sitting in the back and typing and doing my work just so that I could be close by, you know, when he was four years old. And, you know, really it's at some point in elementary school, he was able to do a lot of this on his own. They go to camps throughout the summer. My daughter's uh, doing the same thing. They know how to manage their diabetes. My daughter, not quite as well as my son, but she's a little bit younger and hasn't lived with it for so long. Uh, but this has, this disease has helped us in so many ways to be uh, resi resilient and, and helped us in our life. And so I, I, for me, just the, the human that I am is I have to focus on that um, because there's nothing I can do at this point to change anybody's diagnosis with uh, type one in our family. Do you see your son helping your daughter to, to learn independence and manage the disease state? You know, no, not really. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> but the funny, the funny thing is, is, um, he was kind of more for a while when he was younger, like, well, yeah, I'll let mom and dad do this, or I'll let mom and dad dose me or grandma. And I, you know, you could see it. And like very early on, Cameron, our daughter was like, okay, show me where the nutrition label is. How many carbs? Okay. I'll enter it in. I got this. Well, what is the carbohydrate? Well, why do we need this? And why do we need that? And she was asking all of those really interesting questions because that was just, she was hearing it all the time, but it, it became more like normal to her and more um, oh, this impacts me now. So uh, it's it's interesting. That is. Um, shifting gears a little. So there's been really swift advances in diabetes technology in the last few years. And that's thanks in part to clinics like Sansom Diabetes Research Institute that do help us further this research and innovation, um, as well as clinicians like yourselves. So um, these advances have been largely shown to help improve diabetes quality of life. Um, but also with that comes this constant flow of information to patients. Every five minutes, they're able to see glucose values and get alerts and alarms. And they're also able to see insulin delivery every five minutes and what that looks like. So it's this constant influx of, of data. And um, do you have any advice for attendees listening this evening who are managing that themselves? How do I deal with this constant influx of data? And that takes some some mental burden and, and mental, um, just mental real estate as well. Can I uh, tell, Corey, can I tell a story about the two of us being on a panel and you you doing this? <laughs> sure, I don't, I, I'm not sure what you're going to say, but yes. So <laughs> I, I this, this just stuck with me and it speaks exactly, Leslie, to what you're asking about. Um, and I love that Corey did this because he kind of, you know, he not only talks the talk, but he walks the walk is um, we were on a panel discussion, but in live, uh, in person and uh, Corey and I were sitting next to each other and his uh, CGM kept going off. Um, and finally he shut it off and just stopped using it for the next, I don't know how long, um, and had backup, had uh, a meter with him, I think. It was many years ago, but it was just, you know, I think what I took from that is like the devices are good and can be good, and they're they're also not forever and for all the time. And so I think that's the beauty of Diabetes Wise and this incredible platform that Corey created is it's what it gets at is that you know, there's some periods of time where you're going to use the devices and it's going to be lift burden of disease. And there are other times where it actually is causing more distress. And so you have every right to stop using it and should stop using it to give yourself a break. Or perhaps decide how you want to engage with that device too, right? How can I modify it so that it better suits 
what I'm managing, you know, perhaps changing some of the alerts and alarms and notifications to better suit what you think is, is tolerable perhaps for you at that time? Yeah. And I think that the, I mean, it, um, it, exactly like Michael said, I think that there are, are times when it, there's a, a bit of a tipping point and, you know, and I may have, um, I may notice that in a different kind of threshold than others, but I do think that what, what we don't do a good job of is paying attention to those cues. And then we kind of get to the point where we don't either um, find benefit to using the technology or we get really frustrated with it. And maybe sometimes they're related, but our experience in doing work with adults um, with diabetes and then also kind of across caregivers and kids is that usually the reason they stop using things um, using devices is because they 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 no longer find benefit to it um, and it, it could be you know a person who's finding benefit to it and has the same number of alerts or alarms as somebody who doesn't find benefit but they're more likely to turn it off than the other ones so I think that what we're often kind of charged with helping people understand what the benefit is. And sometimes that's the connections. It's, oh, you just ate this and, and you see what's happening with your glucose and you see that your system is, um, you know, picking up a bit of that. What I think is so great about the automated insulin delivery systems and the Omnipod 5 um, is that they they do take a little bit of that away um, where you in theory can engage a little bit less with your devices. Um, I know that there's problems, you know, with all of them, but one of the things that we're finding um, and it kind of relates to one of the comments in the chats is that that people who are using these systems tend to feel less mental burden when, when they're using them. And so it could be that they, they have, they feel like they have more time to think about other things. Um, the other thing that, that is a big win with all of these systems and particularly the Omnipod 5 with caregivers was how much better their sleep was um, when, when they had a kid who had type 1. And when you get good sleep, everything the next day is better. And so I think that the, the, the reduction in kind of this cognitive burden or mental burden and then the addition of some better sleep really is, I think, the biggest wins with these systems um, outside. And maybe even, I think, maybe sometimes even better than the glycemic side. But along with the glycemic side, I think those are really some of the best ones. Thank you for sharing that perspective. I um, I was hoping to ask you a little bit about the publication that you, you recently authored for psychosocial outcomes for Omnipod 5 users and, and children and adolescents and their caregivers. And I, I think you really nicely touched on that. Um, you know, I, I have to state, of course, there's limitations to that study and it's a, a small um, sample size and a small amount of time that they were they were studied, I think three months overall. Um, but what you really highlighted was the impact on sleep. And I, I think we can all attest that just sleep is so important for, for mental and physical health. And it's something that's really important for people living with type one diabetes to get, to get that good quality sleep at night. Um, Kara, so shifting it over to you, you've been using Omnipod 5 now for a number of years, I think since our, our clinical trial began several years ago. Um, Dr. Hood mentioned that the AID systems and Omnipod 5 allow users to kind of reduce that, that mental burden. Um, so I'm curious if you can share with attendees, how does Omnipod 5 allow space or more mental real estate for focusing on what brings you joy or, or allowing your kids to be kids? Yes, I think Dr. Hood said it so well, um, especially as it relates to sleep. Quite honestly, and if I'm being you know completely true to my feelings with the diabetes, when Lucas was diagnosed, of course, I felt uh, awful that he was going to have to live with this disease. But the, at the other hand, I thought, oh my gosh, are we ever going to be able to sleep at night? We didn't have CGMs at the time. So we were waking up multiple times throughout the night. We would place our hand on his heart to make sure that we could feel it beating. And it was such a stressful time for our family. And when I am rested, when my husband is rested, everything just goes so much smoother the next day. 
And once we were able to get Lucas on the Omnipod 5 system and myself on the Omnipod 5 system, it, it's just like everything changed overnight for us. We, our, our blood glucose levels were staying in a very stable range, rarely waking up, having to check levels to make sure that we were safe and okay. And then having a third person with type one diabetes and rarely having alerts go on throughout the night is really incredible because I've seen this disease many years ago when these kind of therapies weren't available. And so to see where we are today, today and to know that for many of these companies who have um, automated insulin delivery systems, most of the companies are on their first generation. And so if we can think about, you know, the Model T and where we are now with cars, and if you can think about, um, you know, the first iPhone and where we are now with iPhones, it's only going to keep getting better and it's only going to keep in, improving so that people who live with diabetes can truly spend less time thinking about this disease and more time being able to enjoy all the other things that they, um, you know, enjoy, like to do in their life. And, and can I the add sidelines of their kids' games, right? Yeah, I, I just wanted to add, I think um, in uh, something that Kara just said reminded me of you know, this kind of idea, and it goes back a little bit to your question, Leslie, which maybe I didn't exactly, you know, answer, but thinking about these kind of rules of engagement, um, and it might be, I mean, especially thinking about, you know, three systems going off in the middle of the night, I mean, you know, I, you know, I have enough trouble, you know, managing my own, you know, going off in the middle of the night, but, but there's, there's no way, um, and hopefully I'm not, taking you know some liberty care with what you said but like there's no way that you could possibly attend to that at all times and then still have you know any kind of life and so it's really you know we really when we I think working with people we're thinking about like what's the right amount of engagement with a device and what's the right amount of information that comes in and a lot of times people don't want a lot of information they want to kind of synthesize into something that's it's easy and 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 I really do think that the newer systems have really focused on on the the user experience of it and it's much better than it used to be. Um, but I think that um, you know we work with people to if they're on CGM to kind of change their alert and alarm profiles. If a parent has a teenager and they are sharing their their CGM with them. The parents should not look at it at all times. You know, the teenagers should have a chance to be a teen, you know, at certain sections of time. So I think that there's a, it's good to have these discussions about the rules of engagement with, with data and information that comes in from them. You know, Dr. Hood, you, you um, bring up a point that I wanted to dive into a little bit more, which is how important the simplicity of these systems are for users to relieve some of that burden. And I know that there's quality of life research that relates to diabetes technology that assesses measures like insulin delivery satisfaction, system usability, and, and how that plays out or... Um, or can be implemented for the users? What do they think of interacting with their device? How, how easy it is for them to use? So can you tell the audience a little bit about what these measures mean and what impact do these measures have on quality of life for people with diabetes specifically related to automated insulin delivery systems? Yeah, and I can um, you know, speak, I guess, you know, a little bit specifically, and then also more generally, you know, specifically to the Omnipod 5, you know, one of the things that we looked at in, in the studies with the, um, was this, you know, we asked people a lot of questions about how usable the system is and how comfortable and kind of easy is it to manage and, uh, um, um, and, and, you know, we were, we were surprised that, you know, how much people viewed it as, you know, really easy um, device to use. And I think that, you know, that's continued. And the reason that we were surprised is that, you know, sometimes as people take on new things, it takes them a little while to feel comfortable with it. But people really felt like um, it was easy to use from, you know, relatively from the start. And I think that one of the things that I think tech, tech and device companies have done lately is really focus on that kind of initial user experience and helping people onboard pretty easily. Um, so so I, I think it fares really well um, 
And it also helps people stay on them. And I think the other point that we kind of talked about was the simplicity. And, you know, the simpler, the better, I think, around devices, because, I mean, especially if you're thinking about, you know, maybe the, the, the teen brain, or you're thinking about, you know, I guess my brain, anybody's brain, but we're thinking, you know, anytime simpler is better. And so the ways that we can do it, most people don't like necessarily to customize things. Um, a lot of the healthcare providers kind of push that, but a lot of people just want to put it on to enter this, the kind of minor things and then to, to let it work and do its, do its job, which it does really well. Thank you, Dr. Hood. Um, we have just a, a few minutes left, so I wanted to shift the conversation to um, actually something Dr. Harris brought up earlier, which is the topic of community and peer support for people living with type 1 diabetes, um, particularly for teens, because I think it can be often a difficult conversation for teens at that age to approach with their peers. Um, so Dr. Harris, what can you share with the attendees about the benefits of finding that sense of community, particularly for teens? How can they go about approaching that conversation with their peers and um, maybe finding a sense of community amongst their peers who are not living with type 1 diabetes, but are within their, their close circle of reach? So I'll tell you what not to do, because I did it. Uh, it was part of a study where we thought this was really cool idea is that at diagnosis, the teen was going to identify a friend to come to the hospital and just be present through education, not necessarily be educated, but just be present through the process, thus priming the social support network so that when they leave the hospital, there's somebody else who went through that experience with them as a means of support. Okay. Well, we didn't think this through as good psychology, developmental psychologists and child psychologists is that teenage relationships are really tenuous and they change a lot. And so the person who was present may not be their friend, you know, in a week or a month or whatever. Um, but what we also learned is that, uh, you know, people don't want um, necessarily diabetes focused experiences, te teens in particular, don't want diabetes focused experiences as a means of connecting. Um, so, you know, I always tell parents who want their kids to go to some sort of group. And I say groups, ad adults love groups. Adults love to talk about their problems with each other. Teenagers and children don't. And so how do you, how do you expose them to the benefits of connection with others? And this is what I love about the type one community is like we have a camp here. I know there's camps, other places. I tell kids, that's the one camp you're going to go to where you don't have diabetes. Every other camp you go to, you're going to be the diabetic, right? And so those kinds of things, the bolathons, the 5Ks, those connections feel more um, uh, genuine to young people because it's not necessarily this awkwardness of sitting around talking about your health. Um, they used to bring me out to the camp as a psychologist, and I'm supposed to run these groups. And that was the worst thing ever because these kids were just looking at me like, this is not why we came to camp. We came to camp to be campers, right? We didn't come here to talk to some psychologist about our diabetes. So I guess, you know, um, I don't know that I have all the answers to that, but if you can think of ways to, con to make connections with other people in a more genuine way, children are much more um, interested in and their threshold for kind of these, these connections that aren't real, um, they, it's very low. They're not really interested. That's a really um, intriguing study that you were looking at with the hospital and the the childhood friend, and um, a really a really good study finding that you learned about teenage friendships. Um, thank you for sharing. So, um, Kara, but it didn't get funded. I mean, it got funded. <laughs> it didn't get published because we didn't find what we were looking for, which is really sad because I think the findings were really compelling that, you know, we apply these adult ways of thinking to children and it's really misguided. Um, and we do that a fair amount in diabetes. Yeah, that's a really fair point. Um, I know that Sansom Diabetes uh, Research Institute hosts these webinars, and I believe that you also have a T1D 
mentorship uh, program, Kara. So I, I thought it might be a good time to tell the audience a little bit more about that program um, for the attendees who are, are kind of looking for that sense of community locally as well. Sure. So we have a really wonderful relationship with Cottage Hospital. And um, when somebody is diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, uh, when a child is diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, um, we work really closely with them and partnering with some of our families to, to be able to provide support and services and so that they know that they have someone that they can reach out to. Um, there's a lot of other organizations that do that as well, uh, JDRF being one of them. And, you know, we have this mentoring program, but we also have a group for adults and for caregivers. So individuals who live with type 1 diabetes and then a support group um for caregivers who have a, a child with type 1 diabetes and you know this was talked about very early on um, in having the conversations when people are coming to these groups they talk so much about how what they're learning and the tools and the tricks is really from talking to others and not necessarily talking to you know their physician or their endocrinologist and so I think it's really important and I take a lot of pride in knowing that we offer that at Sansom Diabetes and that people have that um, as an outlet and support to get them through the the hard times. That's incredible thanks for sharing Kara. Um, I saw there was just, I know we're at time, there was just one question um, in the Q&A, which I think Dr. Hood addressed. So thank you, Dr. Hood, for doing that. And for um, Katie and Bethany for managing the, the webinar chat. Um, I'd really like to thank you all so much for attending and, and thank our panelists, um, Kara, Dr. Hood, Dr. Harris. Thanks for sharing your wisdom, your insights, your experience and being so candid, I know these topics can be vulnerable for some at times. So um, really appreciate you you being candid with us. Um, thanks for um, having us to Sansom Diabetes Research Institute for hosting this webinar and uh, really for bringing such a lovely sense of community to your patients. So um, thank you again and, and good afternoon and good evening to all and take good care. <laughs>